When Calvin Coolidge was president, he had a first time visitor to the White House. Not wanting to do something wrong, the guests watched everything that Coolidge did. Coolidge was having breakfast and they served him coffee and the president poured some of his contents into a deep saucer and added a little bit of sugar. So the visitor watched carefully and he did the same. And he waited for the president's next move. But he was horrified when the president lifted his saucer from the table and set it on the floor for the cat. No one ever reported what the visitor did next. Such is the power of influence. Everyone can look back on their own experience and see the footprints of influence left in the wet sands of their own lives. Who's influenced your life profoundly? See, they come from a lot of different venues in our lives, such as church and school and family. Who are those people? Was it a teacher who taught you? You remember nothing of what the subject was, but you remember everything they told you? Maybe it was a Bible class teacher who made the light come on in your heart and soul. Or a church member who took special interest in you, and you begin to watch everything they did because you wanted to be just like them. This class is about being a magnetic Christian. Magnets, by their nature, draw metal objects to them. And we are all called to draw people to the message of Christ. It's a huge task, and one that we may neglect to our own hurt, but more importantly, to the neglect results in the damage done to society. How do you become that person, the person who influences and creates the thirst for God's way in their lives? The trouble is that the term influencer has been hijacked and taken over by the internet hacks who want to sell their egos. We want to do better than that. We want them to see not us, but Jesus. In this class, we're going to discuss many things. What's the difference between influence and manipulation? They're not the same. What kind of person is the best influencer? What kind of character influences and which ones don't? How can we make our influence for Christ more intentional? It sounds like we're trying to tie up rain clouds in which there is nothing but just the concept. But the Bible wants us to understand influence quite well. But to do that, it makes concrete and lets us see influence in our mind's eye through a series of pictures. There are four pictures that we would like to look at this morning about influence. The Bible presents concepts in ways we can understand and relate to. They come in ways we can experience. When Jesus spoke, he told stories and We've all known people who've had rebellious teenagers or employees who embezzled, and so Jesus counts the eternal in the nuggets of real life. And that's what happens with influence. It hooks the sacred to the sensible. In each of the images we examine today, it asks a simple question that filters to the surface. How can this help us understand to grasp the concept of influence? Our first image comes from the, what we call the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5, and verse 13, Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be salty, made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except be thrown out and trampled underfoot. We all heard about people who've been described as the salt of the earth types. While we have this gut level meaning, salt is worth exploring further. Salt was one of the four basic elements in the time of Jesus. Those four were iron, gold, wheat, and salt. Salt was so valuable that some cultures used it as their currency, and that's where our saying, worth his salt, originated. It was so valuable that some called it white gold. But it was even more than that. It symbolized things. It was something that stood for friendship. The philosopher Aristotle and said that Greek fellowship meals consisted of two elements, bread 
and salt. Salt did several things. One is what we experience today. It just makes things taste better. How many times has a cook spooned out a broth and wince and said, mm, it just needs a little more salt? But for Jesus' world, it meant the difference between dinner and decay. Because meats of all kinds, but especially the fish from the Sea of Galilee, were salted to preserve them. This trait of salt soon attached itself to salt as something as a sign of purity, some sign of, of significance, a sign of, uh, of sincerity. It was both sincerity and purity of a promise. That's, why, that's how the Old Testament sometimes uses it. In connection with the law of Moses, Numbers chapter 18 says, Whatever is set aside for the holy offering that the Israelites present to the Lord, I give to you and your sons and daughters as a perpetual share it is the everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord for both you and the offering. It was a covenant sealed with sincerity and purity by both the Lord and his people. And then Elisha also used it to purify water. We read in 2 Kings chapter 2, when they returned to Elisha, who was staying in Jericho, he said to them, didn't I tell you not to go? But the people of the city said to Elisha, Look, our Lord, this town is well situated, as you can see, but the water is bad and the land is unproductive. Bring me a new bowl, he said, and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring and he threw the salt into it and saying, This is what the Lord says. I have healed the water. Never again will this cause death or make the land unproductive. And the water has remained pure to this very day, according to the word that Elisha had spoken. The salt made water drinkable again. When we take all of these things together, we can see things about salt as an image for getting into the lives of other people. First, salt does no good if it's not mixed or mingled. Meat is purified not when salt is in the shaker, but when it's rubbed into the meat. If it doesn't come into contact, it can't do its task. Then it also must not just touch it, but it has to penetrate into it. And that's why fish are immersed in salt so it can seep into the pores of the flesh. Third, salt can lose its potency. For 17 years, our family lived on the Gulf Coast, and to say it was humid was an underestimate. It was the only place I've lived that you could sweat in the shower. But all that moisture attacked the crystals of salt and diluted it, made it fairly worthless. And it wasn't uncommon to find salt shakers in restaurants half full of rice to absorb the moisture, because it would be worthless, even though at one time it may have been valuable. So Jesus uses this image of this common substance that purifies and enhances. Such is the image of Christian influence. The second comes as part of the series that he started with salt. Matthew chapter 5, we continue reading in verse 14, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You are the light of the world. How does light help us understand Christian influence? Well, light was a symbol of what was hopeful and good and uplifting. That's how Solomon used it. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, he says, Light is sweet, and it pleases the eye to see the sun. Isn't that true? Don't you feel better on those days when the sun is bright and sunshiny rather than those, those days where the clouds roll in and it rains all day long? It, may, it is pleasing to the eye. It is pleasant. In fact, in Exodus, the contrast is drawn between God's people with God and the Egyptians. Exodus chapter 10 portrays the, the plague of the darkness over the land. 
And it says in verse 23, no one could see anyone else or move about for three days. It was so dark. Yet all of the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. In Egypt, during the plague of darkness, the darkness prevailed in the land of the Egyptians, but the Israelites had light due to God's protection. The same contrast comes a few chapters later when they've marched out of the land of Egypt. They're now camped at the Red Sea, and coming behind them is the Egyptian army. Exodus chapter 14, verse 19 says, Then the angel of, the, of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Through the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night long. You see this great contrast between light and darkness. God has light. The Egyptians have darkness. Indeed, Job speaks of light as the blessing of the Lord himself. In Job chapter 12, 22, he says, He reveals the deep things of darkness and brings utter darkness into light. No wonder this common image of everyday living was laden with so much meaning. Few of us can imagine how dark the world was. We've lived with electric lights for so long, we're never without light. Whether they always lit highways and street lights to the very soft glow of the constant and ever ubiquitous LED lights in our world, we're never without light. The people Jesus' time Darkness was total. The only way you could see was to light a lamp. And Jesus saw this absolutely ridiculous image of someone lighting a lamp and then covering it up so you can't see the light. Instead, he said, you put it on a stand so the flickering light can be cast through the entire room. When the light was lit, darkness vanished. The eye is drawn to light. And even the smallest flame is visible because it is so distinct from the darkness. Everyone who listened to Jesus understood that. We are like a candle lit by the message and shines to a dark world. But Paul uses another metaphor that helps us grasp the meaning of influence. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, he's talking about how people perceive Christians He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and to those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma that brings death, but to the other, we're the aroma that brings life. The pleasing aroma. What does aromas do? Just close your eyes for a moment and think of this. When you were a child and you ran back into the house, you smelled something. What is it you smell? Is it freshly baked chocolate chip cookies? Fresh bread hot from the oven? Chocolate cake left to cool? Or take a new bag of coffee. Open it. Do you smell it? Now, one more test. Can you remember that years later? We had a very dear friend who passed away two decades ago, and Granny wore a particular kind of perfume. After we'd been in Dallas for a few years, my wife and daughter were in a store, and they passed a woman. They didn't know who she was, probably never seen her again. But as she passed, they turned to each other and said, It's Granny. The woman was wearing the same perfume that our friend had, and the associated scent was so strong it triggered memory. Paul says, we are the pleasing aroma of Christ, and when it comes into the midst of people that get a whiff of Jesus himself by our lives and our character, something happens. When they sniff the spiritual air, they may know they're dying because they've rejected the truth. But others, the ones who want to hear the message, it becomes the clone of life. And aromas are such a powerful element 
that you cannot see what creates it, but know what it is. And you cannot ignore it. It captures you. Such is Christian influence. It must be sensed and noticed. But the fourth image of influence comes from a different kind of passage. Moses is explaining to a new generation the ways of God and how to live in this new world, this new land they're going to. And some of that was about how do you train the next generation? How do you keep the faith going? How does it propagate through generations? So in Deuteronomy chapter 6, he says, These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. He speaks of impressing the commandments on the heart of children. It's a Hebrew word for pressing a stylus into wet clay to make an impression. That's how they wrote. They would press the letters in a clay with a sharp pointed stick. And when it dried, it became a permanent record. These verses speak not just of parental influences, but also of a broader application. A parent or anyone else cannot influence children or other people if they're not around them, if they're not with them. The image that Moses presents is about presence, walking with, with children or, or waking up with them or sitting with them at a dinner table. It happens all the time. It's those routines, days, and times of life. And we tend to pick up traits from other people. We do it from our parents. We have their vocabularies, their habits. And if you want a child to go to Bible class, you don't send him to Bible class. You take him with you when you go. That's how the habit is formed. It's seen in someone else. So we, as Christians, make impressions on the world we meet by how we live. That's influence. These four pictures, while simple, have deep and lasting implications. What do they tell us about influence? First, influence interacts with the surroundings and changes them by their contact. Think of salt. It works into the flesh of the meat to stop decay. Light invades the darkness and drives it away. Aroma wafts through the air and triggers memories, either good or bad. If there's no interaction, no influence occurs. But the second is influence demands proximity. Because it interacts, it has to be close. We have to rub shoulders with the people we want to influence. Just think about some of the things we see in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 8, we find a man, a treasurer of Candace, queen of Ethiopia, he appears to be the con a convert to Judaism, making his way back to his African home after Passover. He has a scroll unrolled on his chariot before him that rumbles along through the Negev. Now, he has a Bible. That's what it really best said. He has a Bible. But as we know, the Bible raises as many questions as it does answers. Questions. And he's puzzled. He's confused. He doesn't know what to do. So God could have done many things. Angels could have appeared at that particular moment. A vision could have beamed out of heaven from the skies to answer all of his questions. But that's not what God did. He had a messenger named Philip and sends a man to the nobleman. And the Ethiopian needed a person, a person to explain and a person to demonstrate. That's why Paul is so insistent with Timothy. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Now think for a moment. Paul had just written this letter. Why couldn't they just read it to know? The Bible is replete with, with instructions about morality and behavior. Why did he just say, go read this? Tell them they need to study a little harder. Because people need an example. Someone to see physically interpret the Christian life. 
That's why Paul tells his young, timid, intimidated friend, set an example for them. He could teach more through his life than he ever could through his words. In fact, the truth of the word can easily be destroyed by inconsistency of life. We live in the age of the internet where I, I fear we're expecting it to carry our freight. We want to produce a website or a podcast or a blog post, and that's going to teach and influence people. And yet people need someone, a real live human being with flesh on them, that they know that can show them the way. One instructs, but the other influences. But the third thing is that influence is inescapable. Just as the aroma assaults the senses or life penetrates the darkness, we all have influence in some way. I like the commercial it used to be on about you would see someone who would do a, a good deed for someone. And they didn't figure anybody was list, watching or listening. But from a distance, you notice there's someone who does see it, and they go on their way, and then they are motivated to do a good deed for another, and someone sees that, and it goes on and on. We all have influence. That's the nature of human life. It's not whether we do, but it's what kind. Do you know people you want nothing to do with? You see, they've influenced you, but they've done it negatively. It's the same with the person whose only connection is with the hypocrite. That's their image of Christianity. Now, it's not the one we want to leave them, and it may be an incorrect one that could be corrected, but that's the one they got. And it's hard to overcome that. Every day and in every moment that we live, we influence someone. I think it was captured well by the poet Edgar Guest. This, I think, as I go on my way, whether it matters the words that I say, and what can matter the faults are true of any deed I'm moved to do. This, I think, as I go along, what can it matter, my right or wrong? Whichever path I may choose to take, what possible difference can it make? This I think as I go to town. What can matter, my smile or frown? Can anyone's destiny be altered, for better or worse, because of me? And something whispers, another may be sadly deceived by the words you say. And another, believing and trusting you, may be led astray by the things you do. For much that you ne you'll never see or know will mark your days as you come and go. And in countless lives that you'll never learn, the best and worst of you will return. So God changes us through the power of influence. Jesus came to earth and his actions and life altered the trajectory of history and of our own lives. But then that great work of the master was compounded by other people. The teacher who taught us, the friend who put their arms around us when we were discouraged, the church member who was faithful when we faltered, all the all change us, the nameless and the faith, famous, they shape us. The truth is our souls are painted with the hues of many other lives that have left their color upon us. So then, God expects, no, he demands that we use our influence with others to raise them up and help them see God. Perhaps you've seen this little contraption that's formerly called Newton's Cradle. It's a series of balls suspended by strings. And when one swings, the energy is transmitted through one and then another and then another. No one but God knows how the first interaction we have with others will turn out, inevitably. And as we shall see through this series, this influence depends on three things. First, who we are. Our character and faith are, are like ash from a fireplace. It smudges the lives of others. Influence is determined as much by our character as their hearts. So we need to check who we are. But the second is who we meet. 
The second characteristics of influence is you must be around someone to influence them. How do you leverage our relationships in the best possible way for the kingdom? But the third is how are we different? The final one is about direction. The only way we can influence for God is to be different and distinct. Salt is distinct from decay. Light is different than darkness. And our lifestyles can speak so loudly that they'll drown out any sermons we want people to hear. Influence is so important because it has a bramble component to it. It ensnares life. It doesn't let it go. Ray Charles knew that. Charles was a singer who was blinded as a child. He grew up poor, black, in Georgia during the Jim Crow days. He struggled with racism and drug problems, but he overcame both of them. One of his hit songs was the song, Georgia on My Mind. But in 1961, the state of Georgia banned him from performing in the state because he refused to play only to segregated audiences. Now, almost two decades later, they wanted to make amends. So Charles, his wife B, and his boys were invited to the rostrum at the Georgia State House. Julian Bond, one of the first African-American state senators, took the podium in the Georgia State Assembly which was filled with both representatives and spectators, and he began. Today, we are here to right a wrong that was done to one of our native sons nearly 20 years ago. In 1961, Ray Charles was banned from performing in the state of Georgia because he refused to play before a segregated audience. Thankfully, we've come a long way since then. And as the senator spoke, camera bulbs popped. Ray faced the audience wearing his signature sunglasses. A look of humility is detected on his countenance. His wife stands proudly by his side as the senator continues. Some of us have fought for equality through the political process, but Ray Charles changed American culture by touching people's hearts. So on this day, March the 7th, 1979, we, the duly elected representatives of the state of Georgia, not only proclaim Georgia on my mind as our official state song, we also offer Mr. Ray Charles a public apology and welcome him back home. The crowd erupted in applause. And B leaned over to her husband and whispered, If only your mama was here. Ray, thinking of his mother's continuing influence on his life long after her premature death, answered, she's here, she's never left. May it be said of us that we show the life of Christ to others and that when they can say we are here, even when we're gone. Thank you for joining me this morning. We'll see you again with another lesson next Sunday morning.